Uh, hi everyone, um, so again today we are going to be looking at um, D-dimer, fibrinogen, then I tend to kind of link it a little bit with what I had already discussed on uh, APTT and Anna. Once again, my name is Emmanuel Obodo, I'm a lecturer here in the United Kingdom and uh, I've been working in NHS hospital as a specialist biomedical scientist in hematology and transfusion sciences. Yeah, so let's get into it. Now, I try to focus mainly on the common questions they ask when you go for your biomedical scientist interview, okay? So I've, I've already started off with some, I've talked something on INA, I've had a talk, I've done a talk on APTT. So let's look at D-dimer. So what exactly does D-dimer measure? Okay, because the common routine coagulation uh, parameters that we measure in the lab are INR, PT INR, APTT, fibrinogen, and D-dimer. They are the common thing that we measure. And most times, that's the kind of questions you get. Okay, so let's talk about the D-dimer. So what exactly does D-dimer measure? What does it really do? I'm going to start off by giving you an example. Let's say someone had an accident and the person, maybe motor accident as the case may be, and, uh, or anything like such kind of challenge, and the person was not bleeding. There's no bleeding at all, you know. The person went to the hospital, they said, oh, you are okay, you are fine. Or possibly they had already checked, there's no problem. But after some time, this person start complaining about pain, you know, all over the body, as the case may be, okay. So the, the person now go again to the hospital, and they did the D dime and the D dime is raised. Okay? So, what has happened? That thing that happened is what D dime measure. So, D dime is always associated with what we call FDP, that fibrin degraded product. Okay? So, what happened? Remember, for a clot to form, that means that there will be activation of fibrinogen to fibrin, and that can lead to the clot formation. So what happened that possibly this person, when he had an accident, maybe after some time, there was injury, internal injury, and there was internal bleeding, and nobody knows. And that start forming clots, and start forming a clot debris, that fibrin degraded product. And when it start forming that, okay, it starts circulating in the system, and that can obstruct the blood flow, as the case may be. So that debris of fibrin degraded, that fibrin, that is degraded, that is floating in the system, is what the D-dimer measures. Okay, so D-dimer is not just interested on the clotting, like we've discussed in APTT and INR, is measuring those fibrin, those clot debris in the system. So that's what it measures. So, meaning that D-dimer can give a strong indication of any form of internal bleeding or internal inflammation, as the case may be. Okay, so that's what happened. And again, that's why it can be associated with something like uh, deep vein thrombosis, okay, uh, or pulmonary embolism, as the case may be. These are different form of uh, inflammations, okay, that can result to all kinds of blood clot, and that clotting will now form the debris, and that is why people who have DVT or PE, as the case may be, okay, can have high D-dimer. So that is exactly what D-dimer measures, okay. It kind of being a suggestive of internal clot. Okay? Good. So let's now go straight to um, fibrinogen. So what does fibrinogen measure? I will start off by telling you that fibrinogen is one of the common pathways. So it's seen in the common pathway. Remember we have talked about extrinsic and we have also talked about intrinsic. Okay? So that's where APTT intrinsic, PTRNR extrinsic. So fibrinogen comes in under the common pathway, okay? So if there's any problem, we don't think about maybe there's a fatty clotting pathways in each of the pathways, but if fibrinogen is low, what do you think will happen? There will be a fat, okay? There will still be a prolonged result. So fibrinogen is required for when the clotting activation get to the common pathway for it, for the 
overall clotting formation to be formed. So fibrinogen is quite very important. And that's why when you go for your biomedical scientist inquest, or one of the interview questions, one of the things they will be asking you is about low fibrinogen. Okay, so that question about low fibrinogen is based on the fact that what will happen if the fibrinogen is low? So in this country, United Kingdom, I want you to be thinking about something like less than two. Okay, so maybe depending on the situation, okay, maybe we can even accept maybe 1.5. But when it comes to a pregnant woman, even 1.5 is low. Okay, but definitely anything less than 1.0 is very low. Very, very low. Okay, so they may test you and they say, a fibrinogen of 2.0 or sorry, less than 1.5 or maybe 1.0 or less than 1.0, what does it indicate? It means that the fibrinogen is low. And what is the significance of that fibrinogen being low? It then means that the person can bleed to death, meaning that there is not enough fibrinogen to be activated to fibrin for the clot to form. Okay, and that's where it is very, very vital. This is very, very important, especially Again, like we mentioned about someone going for a procedure, if the fibrinogen is low, they may not want to continue that procedure of a pro operational procedure because that could have a negative effect if anything goes wrong and the person starts bleeding. So, fibrinogen is required, effectively required, you know, for uh, end point of the clotting, blood clot to be able to form. So, that is why it's very important. So, fibrinogen less than 2.0 is low. But most times they are going to base their equation on 1.5 or less than 1.0. So just know that it is low. And what it means then is that um, it could lead to a prolonged um, res uh, coagulation result. So another point you can also note is the fact that if the fibrinogen is low, it indicates that the sample is possibly clot. So you need to check the sample for clot. Why would you say that? Because if the sample is clotted, it means that the fibrinogen had already been converted to, you know, fibrin and then formed the clot. And what it means then is that most of the fibrinogen in the sample has significantly been converted to fibrin and that is why it is low. And that is why, of course, you need to check the sample for clot. And if the sample is clotted, again, it is plain the results. But generally, if fibrinogen is low, it can be very challenging because it means that the clotting uh, fat or clotting time will take longer for it to happen and that can put the patient to danger because the patient start, if the patient starts bleeding that might be difficult stopping that bleed. Now most times what is a what the kind of thing that the system will do or the doctor will do? One of the things they are going to do is to prescribe a cryo precipitate. So when I get to the blood transfusion I'm going to talk more about it. But what the cryo precipitate is rich in fibrinogen. So when somebody has a low fibrinogen, they will prescribe this very cry precipitate for this person, okay? And that can help to enrich, okay, the person's fibrinogen uh, level in the system. Okay? So that's for fibrinogen, and that's for um, D-dimer as well, okay? So what I want you to know that when it comes to the D-dimer, they're going to focus when it is high. When it comes to fibrinogen, the focus will be mainly when it is low. Now, I'd already talked about uh, APTT, I'd already talked about uh, PTR now, but let me just revisit some other things. So in a situation whereby PTR now is low, you know, we talked about when it is raised, okay? What if it is low? What does that really indicate? Now, I want you to think about if the clotting time was supposed to be something like 11 seconds, 12 seconds, for some reason, it's six seconds. That means the person is prone to clot. Okay, so that means the person is prone, the person can easily develop blood clot and that needs to be investigated further. Do you understand? So it, even though we want the clotting time to be short, okay, like, like 11 seconds, 12 seconds, we don't want it to be too short because then it suggests that the person may, can easily develop internal or blood clot in the system. Okay, and again, our PT anar is, is low, it could also be because the person has taken enough vitamin K and there's a lot of vitamin K which encourage this activation of PT, okay, the, 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 the prothrombin, and that cannot help to activate that clotting, you know, quicker than it should, okay. So that is what you can see, or what low uh, 
and our, our beauty and our can indicate. Now, there is one other question that is common, okay, in um, in a situation whereby the APTT is low, okay. So when APTT is low, there is one thing that you need to know. One of the things that you need to know. One, most likely, APTT is significantly low. It is very possible that that sample is clotted. Very, very possible. Especially when the APT is something like, uh, let's say, less than, maybe less than 18, less than 20, like 19, 18, 16, as you can. It's most likely that that sample is clotted. So, significant low amount of APTT suggests blood clot, that the sample is clotted. So, you need to check it for a clot. Okay, then another thing that you need to consider when APTT is low and you check it and the sample is not clotted, what the system is expecting you to answer then is that it could be due to activated samples. So what do we mean by activated sample? A phlebotomy is one to collect blood and the phlebotomist needs to collect both by chemistry sample, hematology sample, whatever thing the person needs to collect. As soon as the person put the vacuum tenor, you know, start collecting the sample, as soon as the strain get to the patient's system, the act, I want you to know that our clotting pathways has been activated. Clotting factors has been activated. So the longer the person take before taking the coagulation sample, the more negative effect it can have on the overall result you will have, you know. So that is why when there is low APTT, significantly low, and you check it, it is not clotted sample, tell them that this could be due to activated samples, okay? So, these are just the few things that you need to know when it comes to D-dimer and uh, fibrinogen, APTT when it is low, or INRPT and when it is low. I can also tell you something. When it comes to coagulation samples, okay, there are, there are pre- pre-clinical or pre-analytical examination you have to do. Sometimes they will ask you, what do you consider first before analyzing, you know, coagulation sample? Do you understand? One of the things you need to know that that pre-clinical examination or pre-analytical examination are what we call HIL test, H-I-L test. What does H mean? Hemolysis. What does I mean? Isteris, which could be high bilirubin, okay? And what does uh, L mean? It means lipemia. So, meaning hemolysis, isteris, or high bilirubin, or lipemic sample can affect the overall result of the coagulation um, samples. So, I want you to take note of these few things that I've mentioned in terms of low APTT, low PTINR, low fibrinogen, and high D-dimer. So, these are your questions when it comes to high D-dimer, what does it mean? Low fibrinogen, what does it mean? Low APTT, what does it mean? And low PTNA, what does it mean? So, next time, what I'm going to do, because I think I've covered the basic question they ask in coagulation so far. I'd already made a video on raised PTNA, raised APTT. So, what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to try next video to project some questions, some results, and go through each of those results, you know, to be able to provide more in-depth answers on what you need to do when such result is given to you. Because if you are going to increase your chances of getting a job in the UK, one of the things you need to do is to memorize the reference ranges. Okay, so memorize the reference ranges. Like these things I'm saying, they will just tell you APTT of 18. What does it mean? So it's up to you to know, does it mean it's normal or does it mean it's low? So I'll go through, I'm going to project a, um, results, my next video, and then go through what those results means. Okay, so once again, um, like I said, please do always uh, comment, like, and share. Okay, I will, I'm looking forward to read your comments and see what you thought, about, what you think about the videos that I'm making. And as well, if you have anything that you want me to also go through, please do put it in a comment. And please send this to anybody that you think that this can benefit as well. You know, um, my aim, like I keep saying, is to make these videos available so that we can all increase our chances, so that you can increase your chances of getting a job in this United Kingdom as a biomedical scientist. Once again, I wish you all the best. 
um, till I come your way again. Thank you very much. Bye.